Jesus. And let's go to Genesis chapter 38. Uh, Haley, if you could put Genesis 38 up on the screen. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to read this whole chapter. And I got to tell you, <coughs> excuse me, I have to tell you that there's a little bit of a biology class in this. So, moms, I know that we don't have youth ministry right now, but this is at least PG-13. Okay, if not, a little bit more. But hallelujah, it's in the Bible, right. right? So we're going to read it, praise right. God, and we're going to talk about it. All right, here we go. Genesis chapter 38, starting in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass at that time that Judah, now we're talking about the literal son Judah, the fourth born of Leah and Jacob, okay? All right. Let, let me ask a question. Elijah, you're over there sitting there by your mama. Jace, you're over there by Rob. Okay, those are the most of the teenagers that we have in here. All right. So uh, let, me, let me see how I'm going to ask this question. Okay. What tribe did Jesus come from? Just whisper to your mom if you don't want to shout it out loud. Whisper it in her ear and she'll, she'll tell us if, if you got the right answer. You, you want to say it, Jace? Okay, well, you tell me. The tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah. Jace said the tribe of Judah. Elijah had it right too, mama? I think he was, get, he was, he getting, he was getting there. Okay, he was processing it. Hallelujah. So there you go. They, they came up with the conclusion that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. But we have to understand tonight what we're talking about is the literal person named Judah who was the fourth born son of Leah and Jacob. Amen. And through the many, many years and the many, many offspring of the genealogies that we see, ultimately Jesus would be born within the framework of the tribe of Judah. All right. So here we go came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in unto her, and she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Chezeb when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. And in process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shearers to Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. And it was told to Mar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goes up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put her widow's garments off her and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her, by the way, and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid, a goat, from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge? Till thou send it. And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet, that was the sign or the seal, usually on a ring, and thy bracelets and thy staff 
that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of her widow. Hood. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adolamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. But he found her not. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burnt. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child. Wow. And she said, discern, I pray thee, whose are these, the signet and bracelets and staff? And Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Shelah, my son, and he knew her again no more. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread saying, this came out first. And it came to pass as he drew back his hand that behold, his brother came out. She said, how hast thou broken forth this breach be upon thee? Therefore, his name was called Therese. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand. And his name was called Zerah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, O oh Lord God, and pray that the truth of your word would come forth, hallelujah, that you would reveal to us your will, Lord God, within your scriptures, that we would gain supernatural understanding of what you're doing upon this earth. Have your way with us tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. What a story, amen? <laughs> you know, the biology part of the class is that when it's talking about seed, it's using, it's talking about the modern term of sperm. And, you know, uh, every 28 days, a woman releases an egg from her ovary into the fallopian tube. And then the sperm uh, from a man will find itself in, in, in fertilized egg. Amen. And then if it's a viable pregnancy, the egg will implant in the uterus. And within about a nine month period, 40 weeks, if you will, gestational age, out comes new life. Amen. And so we see within this story, this interesting concept where the word seed is utilized quite a bit. And for now, I just want you to hold on to that concept in your mind about the seed, because really and truly my message is, is about really more about trial and tribulation. My message is more about trial and tribulation, but also it's, it's about how trial and tribulation is interwoven within the life of of the people of God upon this earth. We've heard the scripture many times where Jesus says that in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. We know that the world in its fallen state is hostile to the people of God. Amen. But we know that God is doing a work on the inside and in the lives of God's people. And then to get them to the place where they will agree with him and partner with him and do the work that he has called them to do. And the more that we do the true work of God, we can expect there to be persecution that comes against the people of God. Amen. But through the process, we learn that God is doing something in our lives. Amen. We learn from, from Job, actually, in Job chapter uh, 23, I believe it is. Job, Job chapter 23. You don't have to turn there. But he says, I go forward. I think I used this scripture the other day. He's not there. Backward, he's not there. I look to the left. I look to the right. I can't find him. But I know this, that when I come forth, that once he's tried me, I will come forth like gold. Peter says in chapter one, he says that that there's a blessing that takes place that we've been begotten of the father. 
What does that mean? That whenever God gave birth to believers, amen, that's literally what it means in the Greek. God's given birth to people. That, that you were born the first time like your father Adam, but there's a new birth in Christ, hallelujah. And you've been begotten of the Father through the blood of Jesus and the resurrection of the Lamb. You've been given new life. And listen, there's an eternal reward interconnected to new life. So Peter goes on to explain in that first chapter, if it's an eternal reward, then the faith has to be tested, my friend. Your faith will have to be tested. If your faith is true, if you are indeed in Christ and you are indeed connected to him and want to do his work, I promise you, your faith is going to be tested as you journey upon this earth. Listen, there's a lot of people that maybe their faith isn't being tested and I'm not trying to, I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not here to judge who's in or who's out. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that you haven't been given that task to judge who's in and who's out? He said you'll know them by their fruit. But I'm trying to tell you this is that if people are just skating along and they're not really experiencing a whole lot of stuff. Now, I think Brother Kirk brought it up in his message recently. We shouldn't get confused. Because sometimes we can open up improper doorways that allow c confusion and chaos and frustration to happen in our life. Okay, and that's different. But, but there's also the truth that whenever we're walking properly with the Lord, when we're moving forward in the things of God, that the enemy wants to come against, he wants to attack, and he wants to come against the work of God. And so Peter says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Yes. The scripture talks about not being conformed by the world, but to be transformed by the renewing Amen. of your mind. And, and it talks about being conformed into the image of Christ. And the idea is that there's a molding that's taking place, a molding and a fashioning by the hand of God that causes us to look more like Jesus and less like us as the Holy Spirit wields the scalpel. You've heard me say it that way before and performs that circumcision of the heart and has his, and has been given permission by us to do so. Because we can resist the surgical hand of the Lord and, and we can stiffen our neck and harden our heart towards the will of God. But in the process, Ephesians 2.10 says this, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in. So God's got a plan for your life. He told Jeremiah, he said, before you were in the womb, I, I knew I had a plan for your life. I called you to be a prophet before you were knitted in the womb, Jeremiah. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for my life. Amen. And, and he wants it to come to pass. But the enemy wants to pervert the plan of God in our lives. And at the same time, the faith must be tested because it's an eternal reward. Yeah. There's no way around this. Right. And so many times, there's, the enemy will come against us in so many ways. So, sometimes whenever we're doing the work of the Lord, I was thinking about some of these passages of Scripture. Where, you know, the beloved apostle, can you remember the story at the end of the fishing trip? Peter says, I go fishing, and I've, I've taught that many times through the years if you've been with us. But in the Greek, the idea is, is that he's leaving his new life in Christ. Whenever Jesus said, I've called you to be fishers of men, because previously he was a fisherman. And when he says that, I go a fishing, and then the other said, and we go with thee, the idea is, is that he's turning his back on the faith. He's denied Jesus three times. He, he's, I heard an old preacher a long time ago from New Zealand say he was in the Mully Groves, whatever that means. He was down. The spirit of heaviness had landed upon his back and was, and was trying to cause him to feel, I can't, no, I've done, I've done something wrong. I'm not right with God. Surely God's hand is against me. And he's turning away and he's going back to his former way of living and the disciples are following him. You remember that story, right? Jesus is like, this can't happen. Hallelujah. This is, this is what I'm about to shake up the whole Roman Empire with. This is what I'm about to shake up the whole world and let the gospel of my truth go forth. And so what does he do? He meets him on the Sea of Galilee. But one of the things that's interesting is that after Jesus 
comes to Peter and he says, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lamb. Do you love me? It's that there's so much depth to this and we don't have time for that. But what's interesting to me is that in verse 21, after it says this <laughs> in John chapter 21, it says in verse 20, 21, 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. And then there's this, this dependent clause in the sentence. The one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? Now, I don't mean I don't like taking liberty with the text. I really don't. But to, to, God put that in there. So I'm going to deal with it a little bit. I try to put myself in the, in the sandals of Peter. I'm, I'm, at the, I'm at the last supper, like we call it, the Passover. The last Passover, the first communion, supper, hallelujah. Peter's here. Jesus says that he's going to be betrayed. The beloved disciple, which is John, who's the author of the letter, is leaning up against Jesus. And Peter obviously was paying attention because John took the time by the Holy Spirit to put it in here that Peter's looking now at this fishing expedition, at Jesus walking with John, and John mentions the fact that this is the same one that was with Jesus. And, and so in my mind, that Peter's like looking at John walking in close proximity with Jesus. And, and, and Peter remembers the supper. And he remembers John leaning up against the Lord and saying, who is it that's going to betray you? And now over the last three days, three to four days, however long it's been, Peter has been bombarded with the fact that he denied the Lord three times. The very thing that Jesus told him he was going to do came to pass. And now the enemy is tormenting him. And he's, he's ready to go back to his former way of living. And even after all that Jesus speaks to him, his response is this. In verse 21, Lord, what about this man? Jesus' response is to him, if it is my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. That's one of the dangers whenever we're serving the Lord and we're in the midst of the battle and the Lord's trying to perform the workmanship on us and he's over there, got us on the potter's wheel and he's spinning it, he's adding some water and he's molding and conforming into the image of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I prayed that the other day again. And I, 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 I prayed it because the first time I prayed it, Many, many years ago, I said, Lord, make me look more like your son. And he said, son, did you pay attention to what they did to him? The other day, I prayed it again. I said, Lord, I remember. I remember what you told me about. I need you to do it in me. I need, I need you to do it in me, Lord. I need, I got to look, I need to be more like him. I need to be less like me and I need to be more like him. I trust you, Lord. I put my life in your hands and I trust you. And I'm asking you to make me look more like Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And sometimes that doesn't feel good. Amen. Come on. It's almost like a symphony is taking place. Yeah, Those of you that are on text church, it was just amazing this morning because a couple people started saying, Good morning. I think it was Pamela and somebody. Said, good morning. And I was jogging when I said, Good morning. And then I and I had just finished writing some of these thoughts down. And so I sent Genesis 50, verse 20, which has to do with Joseph. And what was amazing was that Jeremy posted up on there. He said, The divine maestro. You know, a maestro is like an accomplished conductor of a yeah. symphony. Yeah. He had no way to know that my whole illustration in this message was about a symphony. He had no way to know that. So anyway, that just blew me away. But, but what I want to say is, is that as I was thinking about the things that happen in people's lives and the trials and the tribulations, because, you know, Romans chapter 5 talks about this. It says, now having peace with God. I'm sorry, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. 
and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation works patience. Some of the newer translations use the word endurance. Tribulation works endurance. Endurance experience. The newer translations say character. Tribulation produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character results in hope. The hope of God doesn't leave you. A shame. There is a process to Christianity. Yes, right. yes. And the good news is this, is that when you're justified, you're justified because of the blood of Jesus. Yes. It's not your yes. righteousness that allowed the Father to declare you innocent. It's the blood of Jesus. Yes. And when you accepted that by faith, then the, just, then the righteousness of Jesus was laid upon you. And now the Father can say, you are righteous in the eyes of God. And because of that, you have access to grace. The supernatural working power of the Holy Spirit doing a work on the inside of you. And the way that he does it is many times he will allow tribulation to take place. Yeah. Word of faith preachers don't like that stuff. Wait, hold on a second. No, what about the rolls? What about the Rolls Royce? What about the three-piece suit? You might get one, but it's not promised. What is promised is in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Listen, the word tribulation literally means the press. Jesus on the Mount of Olives was in a garden called Gethsemane, which means olive press. The word tribulation means to be pressed. Jesus is in the olive press, so-called, while he's praying and, and asking the Father, if it's possible, take this thing out of the equation. Nobody in their human thought process wants to be nailed to a cross. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What about you, Christian? What about me? What, whose will is it that we're trying to live for? Because, see, all this is folded into the symphony of God. The great composer has written it this way. The great conductor is conducting the symphony. Hallelujah. And he's got the, he's got the strings over here. He's got the wind woods over here. He's got the brass over here. He's got the percussionist over here. And he's over here and he's conducting the whole show. And I started to look up some words and I didn't write them down. Words that have to do with music. And they got words that talk about accelerating the music. They got words that talk about bringing it down. The word harmony is oftentimes used within music. I mean, so many different words that describe the movement of music. But one word I was looking for, and I was wondering, is it in there? And I meant to I meant to get y'all to do this before, and I forgot. But if you could just, and I think that the right word would be discord or discordant. I was going to get y'all to like just strum a chord and somebody else hit a chord, an opposite chord on the keyboard. I meant to do it, sorry. And then I was going to come over here and just kind of clang the cymbal. It was just going to be all off kilter, and none of it was going to work in unity. It was going to be full of discord, and the word there used is cacophony. Okay, and, and see, the word cacophony was not in that list of musical terms that I was looking for. Because the cacophony is not supposed to be in a symphony. As a matter of fact, if there's cacophony in the symphony, it's likely the conductor is going to question you. I don't know if you got a Charlie horse or what happened, Mr. French Horn, but if you do that again, I know you're a, you're a professional and you're being paid if that happens again, and it wasn't a Charlie horse, it's likely we're going to have to replace you. <laughs> I think about the life of Judah, and I see that as a cacophony. Wow. Because, see, that wasn't supposed to happen like that. Judah wasn't supposed you know, The whole thing started in a way that it should have never even happened. Because, see, his great-grandfather, Abraham, what did he say? To, to Eleazar the servant, go and find my son a woman, not a Canaanite woman. Go find my son a woman from my family over there in Ur of the Chaldees and bring her back over here because I don't want the offspring connected to the Canaanites. I don't know what it was. Well, I know what it was. There was a lot of weird seed going on connected to the Canaanites. But it wasn't just great-grandpa Abraham. It was also grandpa 
Isaac said the same thing about Jacob. Don't take a wife from the Canaanites. It was a family tradition given to them through the revelation and the anointing of Abraham to let them know, don't intermarry the Canaanite women. So what does Judah do? He goes and finds him a Canaanite. And he has offspring with her. He puts his seed in this woman. And he produces seed with her, Ur, er, Onan, and Shelah. The Lord said that Ur that er was wicked and slew, slew him. And, that, and, and you know the story about Onan's over here spilling his seed on the ground. But what's the most amazing thing about this story is its positioning within the whole of Scripture. I can remember about 12 years ago I was jogging on that fig street extension and I was cutting the corner and I was listening to it in my phone. And I was like, Lord, what in the world were you doing putting that story about Judah where you put it? Okay, what, what I'm trying to tell you is, we're talking about trial and tribulation, my friend. We're talking about a symphony, and God is the orchestrator, and he composed the whole symphonic, the story. You know, many, many times I've had the privilege. I didn't think it was a privilege at the time, but I'm glad I did. I've seen ballets. I've seen operas. I've, I've listened to symphonies before. I'm so glad I did it. I thought it was kind of like silly when I did, you know, kind of like a, something, something that a girl does or whatever, something like that. But I'm so glad I did. See, a symphony, oftentimes the orchestra plays the symphony, and it's a musical accompaniment. Man, when, when there's an opera, there's lyrical stuff, but it's telling a story. Yeah. The composer wrote it to tell a story. See, so God is the great composer has written a story. And many times, if you've never seen the opera before, you don't really know what's coming until you get to the end of the story. But yet the composer knows the whole time. And the great conductor's over there leading the way and he's bringing it. To, so if you look at the place where this story of Judah is inserted, if you went back one chapter, you would realize in chapter 37, it's the story of Joseph. And if you took the story of Judah out, you would have nine successive chapters all connected to Joseph. So why after chapter one, whenever Joseph, who is sold by his brothers, by the way, who his brother Judah came up with the idea to sell him instead of killing him. Judah said, why don't we just sell him to these Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, which is kind of amazing by itself, considering the fact that Judas sold his brother Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And if you go back into King James and you look at the name for Judah in chapter 1 of Matthew's genealogy, the word is Judas in the Greek. Judas is the name used in the Greek for Judah. So his own brother sells him for 20 pieces of silver. Judas in the New Testament sells Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. That's another story for another time. Wow, is all I can say. And in the midst of that, Judah sells his brother, and then they sell him, and he's on his way to Egypt. And then God inserts this story in the middle of the Joseph story. And if we just skip over Judah and we go through Joseph, that's where the trial and the tribulation comes into play. Seemingly really unwarranted. I was thinking, because I've been writing some stuff about, you know, right, I'm actually work, kind of in a way working on a book right now. But in the story, I was thinking about trial and tribulation. I was thinking about Job, the life of Job, and also thinking about Joseph. And these are two people, really, that it seems as though the attack on their life was kind of in a way unwarranted. It's like whenever we step back, I mean, we don't know everybody's details, but when we step back, we think to ourselves, or at least I do, I'm like, well, we're blind. I mean, at least with Job, we understand why, because we're given the picture behind the scenes, and we see that, that God allowed us to see it, but poor Job didn't know all that. I don't remember ever reading that God in, in, informed Job that, oh, by the way, just hold on, son, because, see, I told, I told the enemy, because, see, he felt, look, I don't have time to get into all this, because this is some deep thought process, but... 
you know, the enemy who saw me with his celestial eyes rebelled against me. And so I'm about to show him that he's not going to get the better of you because I told him to consider you. And this is what I'm wanting the people called by my name to do is to hold on to me. Because one day Paul said, don't you know that we will judge angels? Paul, we're over here caught up in physical trite things that go on in life. Oh, you hurt me. You offended me. Paul, so Paul says, brother brings brother to court. Don't you know that one day you will, we will judge angels? God is working a symphony. He's working a, a, he's a conductor of an orchestra. And he's getting things done. And the Lord wants us to get our head right. Amen. Amen. And he's saying you're going to go through things. Yes. Yes. And, and, you know, at least I know that Job definitely did a little bit of complaining. I mean, I'm pretty sure I would have done a lot more. <laughs> I've already been complaining the last three weeks about this. And it ain't nothing like what he went through. I don't remember Joseph ever complaining. Oh, if he did, the, I don't, the Bible didn't tell us about it. Surely there were some dark times. I mean, even, look, even whenever you look at the Apostle Paul, the, the second letter to Timothy, whenever he's writing that, he's in a pit. I know I've told y'all that. Bring the cloak, bring the papyrus. Oh, bring John. He's profitable to me for ministry. The very one that had drug up on Paul on that missionary journey with Paul Barnabas, now all the bitterness is gone, <laughs> if there was bitterness. It's, all, it's like, bring him. He's worthy. He, he's going to help me in the ministry. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know, whenever he's in the, in the Roman jail the first time, it's really more like a house arrest. He writes the letter to the Philippian church. He uses the word joy so many times in that letter. It's not even about how you so joyous whenever you got an ankle brace along connecting you to the, the Roman guard and then you're living under Caesar's hot palace. How are you so happy that you write joy that many times? Oh, hallelujah. He brings a joy that's unspeakable and full yes. of glory. Hallelujah. Yes. A peace that surpasses hallelujah. understanding. Yes. And in the midst of the trial, the Holy Spirit is there molding and conforming and fashioning for the purpose of God's work. Yes. And here's Joseph. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe Paul complained. I, maybe Joseph complained, but I didn't hear it. I didn't read it. And, and because of his endeavor, I mean, look, and there's a juxta, this is a big word, juxtaposition or a contrast between Judah, who's over there going into a Canaanite woman, Who's over there, all his boys spilling their seed on the ground. Over there going into a harlot, right? And here's, and here's Joseph pulling like a Holy Ghost. Foo, foo, like move, like getting out of his robe like that. Here's Potiphar's wife over here like, oh, you handsome man. Let me have you come lie with me. And, and here he is slipping out of that. He's like, no. And he's falsely accused. He's in, and, and, he, and he does, and he, you know what? The hand of God was upon him. Yes. He goes from the pit to Potiphar's house, from Potiphar's house to the prison. I don't know about you, but by this time, I'm probably a root of bitterness is trying to grow in my heart. I'm like, Lord, what are you doing? You gave me that dream so long ago, and that's when everything started. Give me that dream about the corn stalks and all that stuff. And then and, and, and there's sheaves, I'm sorry, there's sheaves, and there's sheaves bowing down to me. And none of it even really made sense, but I was trying to be an obedient servant. I told my brothers and my father about, about the dream, and then they turned around, and then my, even my own daddy was mad at me, like, oh, well, we're going to bow down to you. And it all started there. They started to despise me. And they started to hate me. And now look at me, God. I was just trying to be a faithful servant and to do what it was that you told me to do. And now I find myself in this prison. And in the midst of that, but I don't know if he actually did that. He might have actually not done anything like that. As a matter of fact, it seems like he was probably just like focused on God's will. Just focused on God's will. Oh, you got me here now? All right, Lord. I saw what you did at Potiphar's house. Hallelujah. You got me out of that pit. The brothers of mine, they were ready to take my life, but you spared my life. See, there's always another way to look at it. They was about to take me. I could hear them talking about killing me when I was in that pit. Hallelujah. And I'd rather not be in Egypt right now, but I'm still alive. And as long as I got breath in my lungs, I'm going to serve you, Lord. So even though I'm in this place and it's a mess, go ahead. Give me strength. What you going to do next, Lord? What's he going to do next? And with a heart like that, God, 
I'm ready to use somebody like that, my friend. The next thing you know, here come the dreams. And Joseph just, Joseph, break, oh, I, I got the answer for you. He interpret that dream. And look, he don't shrink back. Don't you wish preachers were like that today? Yeah. You're going to be released in three days. You, he's going to take your head off. <laughs> Whoa. Yes. yes. Tell the truth. And in the midst of all of that, when the time is right, God uses him. They remember, oh, there's an interpreter of dreams in the prison, Pharaoh. Hallelujah. He's gifted. <laughs> He's gifted. And, and Joseph gives the interpretation and prepares Egypt for this great famine. Now, one of the things that one of the things that I want to I want to ask you is this: is that you reckon that the Lord knew that there was a famine coming? <laughs> Way back when he gave Joseph the dream about the fact that his people would be bowing to him. Wow, that dream seems reminiscent of what was to come. So Joseph was given a dream about his brothers bowing down to him long before that ever happened. And then as Joseph goes through the trial and tribulation in a faithful way, God continues to propel him towards his destiny like a great conductor operating, working on a symphony, allowing all of these things and what seems so horrible to the naked eye, so frustrating in the midst of the press and feel so bad, God's actually positioning his people to be in the right place at the right time so that he can yeah. use them for a greater purpose. And then you got that whole story about his brothers, right? Y'all remember about the putting his cup in their sack and you just got to go back and you got to read the whole nine yeah, chapters if you want to do that. But, but, but whenever it's all said and done, when he reveals himself to them and they begin to weep and there's just this big old weeping thing going on and they begin to say that they're sorry. And, and, and Joseph says in, John, in, in Genesis chapter 50 <coughs> verse 20 he says this but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Wow. What a, what a beautiful thing when you've been going through trial and tribulation in your life. And then God opens up a door sometime later and he reveals to you why you was going through that. You didn't know. See, because God doesn't have to do that. God does not have to show us why we were going through the things, but he's, he's gracious and he's merciful like that. And sometimes after you've been through the trial a little bit and you get, you get past it like in Joseph's life and then, you, and then God's gracious and he shows. So right there when he sees his brothers and he sees this situation and they're, they're saying that they're sorry to him, he says, no, you meant evil against me, but now I'm getting it. Now it's making sense. The Lord's connecting the dots in my mind. That's what the dream was about. That's what the pit was about. God and his providence. Oh, and the great composer writing the great symphony, the great story now unfolding before Joseph's eyes. Now it makes sense why I had to be sold by my brothers. Now it makes sense why I had to be taken out of the pit. And now it makes sense why I was lying on and ended up in the prison. Now it makes sense why you gifted me with the, with the interpretation of other dreams. Oh, it's all coming to pass and it's all making sense. I get it now. God used me to save people. You know, I was thinking, I can't prove this. This is Matt's commentary right here. I wonder if that had something to do with a coat of many colors. A prophetic coat, Brother Kurt. What you talking about? Multiple nations came to Egypt during that time. Multiple people groups were saved during that time. That's just, that's just my little commentary. I don't know for sure. I didn't read it from anybody else. It might be right. It might be wrong. I don't know, but it makes sense. But let me tell you something. Joseph did not get the full revelation. Joseph, oh, he knows it now, my friend. He knows it now, but he didn't know the full revelation of what God was using him for. And the truth of the matter is, is that, see, you and I may not always know the full revelation of what God's doing in our life. 
See, the Bible says that there's a cloud of witnesses that are going before us. Abraham sojourned on an earth that was hostile against him, and he never saw the promises come to pass. Will we tarry if we don't see the promises come, on, come, on. come to pass? Would we still tarry and continue to hold on to the Lord? Amen. But look, I'm going to tell you how I know that Joseph didn't see the whole thing. And this is the interesting concept of how that chapter was placed in the millennium moment. As I'm jogging down Fig Street 12 years ago, and I asked the Lord, have you ever, somebody put that on text group today. I think it was maybe Lily said something about, you ever been talking to the Lord, and you ask him a question, and then all of a sudden he answers you right then and there. Yeah, I know we've all probably seen that kind of thing happen. To us before, and isn't it so good when it happens? It's like you ask the question, and then he speaks to your spirit. It doesn't always happen. Maybe it happens that way all the time for y'all, but it doesn't always happen that way for me. But that day when I was jogging, you ready for this? The Holy Spirit answered me immediately. I'm jogging down the road, and I'm like, Lord, why did you insert the story of Judah right there in the midst of Joseph's trial and tribulation? And this is the answer I got. I'm preserving the Judah seed. I'm preserving the Judah seed, son, because you see, many, many years later down the road, if you go read the genealogy of Matthew, Phares had a son named Esram. Well, that's read. You don't want me to read the whole thing, do you? Phares begat Esram, Esram, Aram, Aram, Aminadab, Aminadab, Nason, Nason, Salmon, Salmon, Boaz of Rahab, Boaz, uh, Obed of Ruth, Obed, Jesse, Jesse, David, David, Solomon uh, of Uriah, the, of, the, of, of Bathsheba, Solomon, Rehoboam, Rehoboam, Abiah, uh, Abiah, Asa, Asa, Josephat, uh, Joram, jo Ozias, uh, Jotham. Uh, you, get the, you get the point, Ezekiel, Josias, and down to Babylon, Jeconias, and then finally it says, Joseph was begat by his father Jacob, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called the Christ. Wow. No, no, y'all ain't. I don't think y'all get it. <laughs> wow. Joseph, strategically placed by God in advance because a famine is coming. And then Jacob said, we need corn, boys, because we're about to die over here in this desert. But God, in the midst of Joseph's trial and tribulation, was positioning him. So I don't know what you're going through, Christian. I don't know what you're facing right now, but I gotta, I'm got i going to tell you something. You're part of God's plan. It may not be as big as Joseph was. Oh, but it's big because yes. even if it's one soul, yes. even if it's one soul saved from the throes of hell, it's a big thing. I'm here to tell you he's preserving the Judas seed. Yes. So the question that we have to ask ourselves as believers is this. How are we handling the Judas seed in the midst of a famine? Ooh. Singers, musicians, you can come. I want us to ask the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit. Lord, how am I handling the Judas seed in the midst of a famine? Am I just spilling it on the ground? Am I just treating it as though it's nothing? Or is my heart... Connected to your heart, Lord. I want my heart to beat like yours. Amen. For your kingdom, for your work. Praise God. Do a work in us. Holy Spirit, do a work in us. Amen.